Grace and peace to you on this ninth Sunday after the day of Pentecost. It is our joy and privilege to welcome you in the name of the risen Jesus. In today's psalm, the psalmist writes, The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his compassion is over all that he has made. May this truth and this time together in God's holy word comfort and encourage you this coming week as we now prepare our hearts for worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. And now let us confess our sin. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Glorious God, your generosity waters the world with goodness, and you cover creation with abundance. Awaken in us a hunger for the food that satisfies both body and spirit. And with this food, fill all the starving world. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from Isaiah, the 55th chapter. Ho, everyone who thirst, come to the waters. And you that have no money, Come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. 
incline your ear and come to me. Listen, so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Psalms 145. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Lord, you are good to all, and your compassion is over all your works. The Lord upholds all those who fall and lifts up those who are bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon you, O Lord, and you give them their food in due season. You open wide your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. You are righteous in all your ways and loving in all your works. You are near to all who call upon you and to all who call upon you faithfully. You fulfill the desire of those who fear you. You hear their cry and save them. You watch over all those who love you, but all the wicked you shall destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord. Let all flesh bless God's holy name forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Romans, the ninth chapter. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when Jesus heard of John the Baptist's death, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, Jesus saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to Jesus and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. The disciples replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And Jesus said, bring them here to me. Then Jesus ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, Jesus looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You know, when the pandemic first began, people were 
quick to collect food for hungry families and, and were intentional about checking in on the neighbor and taking steps to protect those who would be most vulnerable to the virus. And every day, the news showed feel-good stories about people stepping up for the neighbor. And it did make us feel good. Well, as the weeks have now become months, people are still stepping up for the neighbor, but the emotional exhaustion of working at home and virtual meetings and safe distancing and the uncertainty of when life may begin to look normal again, not to mention the ever-increasing needs of the unemployed and the underemployed have brought about a new feeling. One psychologists call compassion fatigue. It's normally associated with professionals working in high stress trauma settings and its symptoms include workplace friction, cynicism, profiling, and, and becoming less concerned about the needs of others. While compassion fatigue is quite normal, the reality is, even without the chaos we currently live in, compassion for others is difficult to maintain, particularly when the needs around us seem impossible to satisfy. The 14th chapter of Matthew's Gospel begins with a flashback story of King Herod's arrest of John the Baptist after John called the king to repentance for marrying his brother's wife. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid to because the crowds considered John to be a prophet. Well, that all changed during an elaborate birthday party that Herod throws for himself when he makes a ridiculous promise to his wife's daughter and his fear of appearing weak to his guests dwarfs his fear of the crowds, and so Herod has John beheaded. That's where today's gospel begins. When Jesus hears of John's death, he gets into a boat and, and goes off to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds hear that Jesus has left, they follow him by foot, and by the time Jesus reaches his destination, they're waiting for him. Many have come in need of physical healing. Many others have come because they've either heard of or witnessed Jesus' power. And they've all come in hopes of new life. You see, Jim, Jesus demonstrates a different kind of power than the power of Herod and, and Rome. And that becomes even more obvious when Jesus sees the crowds. For instead of sending them away or seeing their needs as a distraction or an obligation or a means of securing more support and power, Jesus has compassion for them, a compassion that moves him to draw near to their suffering and offer what they need at that very moment, curing the sick. Well, as evening draws near, Jesus' compassion seems to have rubbed off on his disciples, who express concern for the hungry people and suggest that Jesus send them away so they can go into the neighboring villages and find food. Now, this certainly makes sense, but there's more to the compassion that Jesus embodies than having pity for others. Jesus' compassion leads to action which is exactly what he demands of his disciples saying, well, no, you give them something to eat. Excuse me? How, how can they feed the crowds? They've got nothing. What will practically nothing, hardly, hardly anything, not, not even enough to give everyone a little taste. But this isn't just about feeding the crowds. I mean, if it were, Jesus could have turned rocks into bread or, or had a supersized Happy Meal suddenly appear before everyone. But Jesus also has compassion for his disciples. And so he offers them what they need at this very moment, a sign of God's power and presence, a sign that will move them beyond the scarcity they see, beyond what appears to be reasonable and rational, beyond the limitations they see in themselves, beyond what they may want the kingdom of God to be and how they expect God to act and provide to who God really is. 
and what it will mean that the kingdom of God is drawn near in Jesus and, and what it will mean to follow him. So Jesus asked the disciples for these loaves and fishes they see as nothing. And he takes them and he looks toward heaven and he blesses and breaks them and gives them back to the disciples. And the disciples take the food to the crowd and everyone eats until they're filled. And as the disciples gather the leftovers, they suddenly receive a glimpse of a kingdom where power is exercised with compassion rather than fear and greed and envy, not to control or to demonstrate power over others, but to serve others, revealing the abundant grace and power and presence of a God in whose hands what appears to be nothing is more than enough to offer hope and accomplish what God desires to accomplish. You know, it's actually the same compassion that God demonstrated for their ancestors in the wilderness, providing bread from heaven for 40 years. And the same compassion that led God through the prophets to call the people to repentance when they strayed. And the, the same compassion the prophet Isaiah embodies in this morning's first lesson, calling a disobedient people exiled in Babylon who believe that God has abandoned them to stop wasting their lives on things that can not, not satisfy their hunger and thirst and to return to God. The God, as the psalmist reminds us, who time and time again has proven to be gracious and merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. It's this same compassion that Jesus is calling his disciples to offer, not just by following him or watching him or believing in him, but by joining him in God's work, sharing in the suffering of others, embodying what they have seen and received in Jesus, the presence and power of a God who gives us everything we have and who uses what we offer for his work to provide an abundance of care and love for others. Well, the truth is, the lesson is far from over. When the needs of others seem to be greater than they can bear or they become distracted by their own needs and limitations, compassion fatigue will grab hold of the disciples and they'll forget what they've seen, what, what they've been part of, and, and what it means to follow Jesus. They're going to need help if they are to remember, if they are to show compassion. And so on the night before God's compassion for us in the world takes its most radical and extravagant form on a cross, Jesus once again shares in his disciples' struggles and doubts with with another meal, one in which he offers his very presence, his body and blood and bread and wine, giving them new life, one in which they are fed to feed others and forgiven to forgive others and shown compassion in order to be instruments of God's compassion for others. You know, getting back to compassion fatigue, for a moment, psychologists suggest it's, it's, it's pretty simple to, com to combat this fatigue, that it, that it begins with self-awareness and then setting appropriate boundaries to protect ourselves. And, and I get that. And in fact, at one level, it is true. But as followers of Jesus, our self-awareness and the boundaries that we set begin in remembering whose we are. That as God's precious children, chosen and forgiven in the waters of holy baptism, we are called to do more than feel pity and to give voice to that pity by praying for someone to do something. We are called and empowered to be that someone, feeding 
and comforting and walking with and praying with and for those who are hungry and sick and lonely and oppressed, embodying and offering through our words and actions Christ's presence and power, not out of, of moral obligation, but out of compassion, because that is who we are and what it means to follow Jesus. You know, if, if you find yourself overwhelmed by the needs that surround us and, and your compassion is becoming dwarfed by fatigue and doubt and fear, and quite honestly, even if it's not, Today, we are reminded that Jesus and his compassion for us and the world offers us what we need now and at every moment. And that is himself. And while we may not be able to gather at table, as we feast on God's holy word in worship, his grace and mercy is more than sufficient to forgive our sins and to strengthen our faith. And that through the Holy Spirit, we are moved beyond our fears, be beyond our perceived limitations to a renewed life of compassion with a God whose compassion and faithfulness embodied and revealed in Jesus never ends. And you see, that is our hope. And it's the compassion that we are privileged to share with a world that is desperate for compassion. And for that privilege, sisters and brothers in Christ, we say thanks be to God and amen. God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ. 
Living together in trust and hope, we profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. You take resources that appear to be meager, bless them, and there is enough. May your church trust that what you bless and ask us to share with the world is abundantly sufficient. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your bountiful creation offers sustenance and life for all creatures. Protect this abundance for the well-being of all. Reverse the damage we have caused your creation. Replenish groundwater supplies. Provide needed rains in places of drought and protect forests from wildfires. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You offer yourself to all the nations and peoples of the earth, inviting everyone to an abundant life. Bring the prophetic vision to ful fullness that all nations will run to you and that nations who do not know you will find their joy in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Hear the anguish of tender hearts who cry to you in suffering and satisfy their deepest needs. Bring wholeness and healing to those who suffer in body, heart, soul, and mind. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You offer freely the fullness of salvation. Give our congregation such a welcoming heart that our words and actions may extend your free and abundant hospitality to all whom we encounter. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You gather your saints as one, united in the body of Christ. Bring us with all your saints to the heavenly banquet. We remember with love and thanksgiving the saints we have known. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. And now go in peace, remember the poor, Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm.